Airing first on Asheville FM, WSFM LP 103.3 in Asheville, this is The Final Straw Radio, a weekly anarchist and anti-authoritarian radio show broadcasting out of occupied Salagi land in southern Appalachia. We bring you voices and perspectives from projects and struggles all around the world. For this week's main podcast, we spoke with an activist at the Atlanta Anti-Repression Committee about the recent police raids and arrests in the Wilani Forest, aka the Atlanta Forest, which have brought charges of domestic terrorism on five people for allegedly building tree houses and throwing stones at cops. These arrests come after the police entered the forest and used quote-unquote less lethal weapons on people they found there, ostensibly participating in the Stop Cop City movement to defend the forest from the building of what might be the largest movie soundstage and police training centers in the world. Be sure to check out the show notes for more information and ways to support them through this repression. And uh, check out our past coverage from the movement to defend Wheelani Forest in Atlanta by listening to or reading our July 3rd, 2022 episode. Also, be sure to check out our podcast released December 14th, 2022, where we shared perspectives from Kyle, Missouri, resident of the Winnemucca Indian Colony in so-called Humboldt County, Nevada about evictions, banishment, and house raising in an escalating process heading through the courts pushed by the Winnemucca Tribal Council. Check out the show notes there for places to find more info and and ways that you can offer help. As an update to Kyle's story, last minute the court changed the link on the Zoom call ostensibly to lower participation. We also heard news on Thursday night that Kyle was tased and arrested by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, or BIA, pigs while trying to get to the house that he shares with his grandmother, and that he was hospitalized and transferred to Reno. You can check out the show notes for links to other sources of information, ways that you can show up, and places you can donate. And we're going to try to update this show for our December 25th episode. Would you please introduce yourself for the listening audience with any name, affiliations, preferred pronouns, location, or other information that makes sense for this interview? Hey everyone, I'm Sarah. I am a resident of South Atlanta. I'm involved in the movement um, to defend the forest and to stop the construction of Cop City for about a year now. And I'm involved with the Atlanta Anti-Repression Committee, um, organizing uh, in support of people facing political charges. So we're talking about the recent police violence that occurred in the Wilani Forest, aka Atlanta in the state of Georgia. First up, can you briefly remind listeners about the movement that's been coalescing there for over the last year or more? Yeah, absolutely. So since May of 2021, there has been activity organizing in a section of the South River Forest in South Atlanta or Southwest DeKalb County that is threatened by two projects Cop City, which is the construction of a massive new training center for the Atlanta police um, being built by the Atlanta Police Foundation, as well as an expansion of Black Hall Movie Studios, which they've renamed to Shadowbox Movie Studios. It's involved a dubious, like possibly illegal land swap between the county and private owner of Black Hall Studios, Ryan Millsap. And these projects are on adjacent plots of land and they're threatening a huge, much beloved section of urban forests, including the in public DeKalb County Park, Entrenchment Creek Park. And for the last year, since October or November of 2021, there's been an ongoing series of encampments in the woods in order to prevent the construction of these facilities and for people who care about the the forest and have a desire to stop these projects to coalesce in those space to gather there and many people have come to live uh, in the in those woods in an ongoing series of protest camps those encampments have included tree sits which have been a contentious ongoing aspect of the protests for for almost the full year, actually, since January of this year, 2022. But the physical encampment and obstruction in the woods is just one element of a much broader movement um, that has involved a, a wide range of people. There's lots of different organizing efforts. There's really seen to be something that has mobilized and galvanized people from all across the city and especially from the area, people who live in the area around this forest and 
who have been involved for many years in the fight for Entrenchment Creek and the South River, which are both heavily polluted. So news sources are saying that six people were arrested and are being charged with domestic terrorism. To your understanding, um, can you talk about what happened? Yes. So on Tuesday, December 13th, there was a large multi-agency police operation in the area surrounding the occupied section of forest. And so um, this is commonly called the Wilani Forest or also the South River Forest. Wilani is the Muscogee name for the South River. It means brown, green, yellow waters. And so this past Tuesday and then again on Wednesday, there was a large scale police operation This involved the Atlanta police, the DeKalb County police, the Department of Homeland Security, who are actually, um, they're like a department within the Atlanta police. They're horizontally integrated with APD. It also involved Atlanta's SWAT teams and the Georgia Bureau of Investigations. And those are just some of the agencies that we know were involved in this operation. And so this is is one in a series of raids. Um, This is the most recent in what has been a long uh, arc of police efforts to control the forest and to capture and charge activists. And so the the difference at this this in this raid is that um, the police came prepared to extract people from tree sets. And so like I said, there have been tree sets ongoing for many months now um, since January in several different parts of the forest. And the people who were occupying those trees were surrounded on the ground by Atlanta police officers and then essentially threatened. Um, And this is not the first time that this has happened, actually. Um, I can go into more detail about that later, about the history of violent threats of the Atlanta police against people who are occupying tree sits. But these, like, Tree sits are makeshift shelters that are constructed within the trees and people live in them in order to prevent ongoing construction. The, the cops surrounded them on the ground, threatened them, asking them to, to, to come out voluntarily, and then pretty immediately began shooting pepper balls and tear gas canisters at the treehouse occupation. So it's like people are in small confined spaces they're having tear gas shot into those confined spaces. And then also what I, my understanding is that there were just like hours of pepper balls, these crowd control weapons being used on the people in these trees, tree houses um, who were eventually extracted um, after several hours of this and were arrested. And so we know that there were arborists that were working with the Atlanta police foundation. This is like a, historically how tree sets are disrupted and people are extracted from them. And so uh, the result of this is that there have been five people who were tree sitters who have been charged with a, a litany of charges, but the most notable being domestic terrorism. And we're seeing that this is like the the, the big accomplishment for the police is to bring forward this charge of domestic terrorism. Yeah. Could you talk about the charges of domestic terrorism? Journalist Will Potter, author of Green is a New Red, pointed out on Twitter that they're being accused of throwing stones at police and building makeshift tree tree houses, like I mentioned. It seems a bit of an escalation to charge them with terrorism for these activities. What do you think is going on here? And could you reiterate what agencies do you think are involved in the policing of this space? It feels like a new generation of anti-infrastructure occupations on Turtle Island since No Dapple, uh, you know, and I'm thinking particularly also about Camp Grayling, that this is an effort to uh, cause a chilling effect. Yeah, so we understand that six people have been charged with domestic terrorism, all of whom were arrested in the site of the proposed construction site for Cop City, as well as for the Shadowbox Studios expansion. And so they're charged under a specific bill, which was passed in 2017 in Georgia. And that is House Resolution 452. And there's some good articles that are coming out exploring this. It's really notable because this is the first time that protesters have ever been charged using this law. So it's a new use of a pretty new law. And yeah, you, you accurately indicate that they 
have been accused of things that are sort of like minor crimes. Many of them, our understanding is, were arrested after being extracted from tree houses, um, like sitting sitting in the tree houses, which is like a historic um, tactic of the nonviolent direct action strain of the environmental movement. Um, and so they were arrested and extracted outside of these tree houses and now are being charged with domestic terrorism along with a slate of other of other charges. Um, and these are, these are mostly blanket charges. It seems like they were all hit with pretty much the same thing. There's a few uh, differences between them, but it does really seem like this is an effort uh, at a scare tactic to implement a chilling effect across the movement to say, um, if you are an activist um, attempting to block or stop construction of a facility to fight for a more livable world, um, that you're at risk of being characterized as like, you know, an, an enemy of of America, of the United States. And so, yeah, what, what else is notable is that this law is was actually voted on by the Georgia legislature in response to Dylan Roof's murderous shooting spree at the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. And so following this, you know, hate crime where, you know, a number of people were, were of black people were killed by a organized, like a, a white supremacist who took violent, deadly action. There is the use of this law now instead to target anti-racist protesters who are fighting against a expansion of carceral and police facilities. And so that's like something notable about about this law. It does seem, and I think that there's like a, a lot of the initial legal opinions. There's an article in the Atlanta Journal Constitution quoting the ACLU, indicate that this is like a really broad and overreaching use of the law. So like not only is it the law possibly unconstitutional, this use of it as well seems really like blatantly illegal, according to um, the other laws locally. But but. This isn't the first time that terrorism has come up in like environmental struggles, in political struggles. There's all of these instances um, coming out of the Green Scare and also recent ecological struggles of the use of terror, like anti-terrorism laws, the designation of domestic terrorists and the use of the terrorism enhancement. And so we have the RNC-8 um, who you know, and the NATO three, both of whom were charged and the anti-terror, or I'm sorry, and the terrorism enhancement was applied to their cases, but ultimately it didn't stick. There's people like Daniel McGowan, um, the early 2000s, and then more recently, Jessica Reznicek, the the valve turner um, who took action against the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, who who was recently convicted with a terrorism enhancement for, uh, you know, interfering with critical infrastructure. But this comes also in the context of yeah a wave a wave of struggles as well as a uh, push from the sort of center the federal government against what they see as a domestic terrorism in the January sixth attempted insurrection at the U.S. state capitol. What else is is notable here is that it doesn't appear we we know that there are ongoing investigations happening around the forest struggle. As I said earlier, this is a really broad struggle. There's so many different parts of it that are, have been involved um, in different groups that have been organizing and taking action to, uh, to pressure people to stop this project, as well as organizing and camping out in the forest itself. Um, but it, it's not like there was an investigation and then some people were targeted and then had charges brought against them that would sort of make sense for something as high level and as like serious as domestic terrorism. Instead, it really seems like there is a political motivation or a narrative motivation and uh, the authorities are acting with some desperation to um, to cut off what is a really robust and successful protest movement. As of this month, it's been one year since they first evicted the initial occupation in this forest. And people have been resilient to a number of raids, to police intimidation tactics, to investigations, arrests, et cetera, because there's a lot of determination in this fight. And so um, what they've done is just come into the woods, uh, conduct a really a raid with a massive use of resources, 
really just disrupt life in the in South Atlanta here and then just arrest whoever that they captured with blanket charges and the people who that they captured you know were were tree sitters we're seeing them use like a lot of old tactics from the repressive playbook there's you know the statement of really high serious political charges in the bond hearing the initial denial of bond an attempt to redirect resources and attention away from the movement away from the enemy and towards the the focus of of simply anti repression efforts getting people free and obviously that is the the priority and desire of the broad movement at this time and l- luckily this is a this is a national movement there's been actions and information nights and uh, awareness spreading all over the country the activism for uh, on this issue has really been something that people have participated in from all across the country because it is evident to people who live in everywhere what the stakes are of the expansion of police resources, police authority following mass movements to confine the role and the murderous capabilities of the police. What we've seen is just increased investment in the police. And this is something that is obviously widely, widely unpopular. Though we believe that prosecutors and the police agencies, including the Georgia Bureau of Investigations and Atlanta Police Foundation, the Atlanta Police Department, are attempting to spread fear, disaggregate the movement, to punish people who have taken part in this, which is something that we've seen repeatedly is just arrest and and imprisonment on charges that will have no basis sticking in court. Um, It's been something that the cops have been attempting with this movement over and over again. And um, this seems to be more of the same, but just on a much higher level. And so it seems like a real overreach to apply domestic terrorism to a local defense of, of a public park, really. Meanwhile, how are you seeing the media and social media engaging with what's happening in the, well, in the Wheelani forest in Atlanta and the rising state repression? Yeah, so we've seen a pretty interesting media response so far. So far, um, there has been an increasing local news narrative that's been building, um, kind of supporting a lot of the paranoid idea police about the movement. Um, that uh, certainly is now being taken to like a really high level. Like there's these really nasty stories on the Daily Mail and um, the other sort of like sensationalized uh, media. But media has been a big, big point of conflict in this campaign. Um, the local outlet in Atlanta, like the, the our, our major new journal, constituted by Cox Media uh, or is owned by Cox Media, which are one of the major funders of the Atlanta Police Foundation and of the project. And so um, the actually the, the or the head of um, Cox Media sits on the board of the Atlanta Police Foundation. So it's like a really serious, tight um, interest. And only through like many months pressure from um, Atlanta residents have fine, um, in stating their, um, affiliation with the Atlanta Police Foundation and the, and the Congress in the project. Um, and the Atlanta Journal Constitution has been called for more serious, um, legal action against the protesters actually for, um, months and like helping to generate this media consensus among local news, um, that really like, over represents certain aspects of the struggle and attempts to divide people um, in a way that has refused. Um, and so, uh, care movement as violent, um, as extremists, as all outside agitators, all of these sort of tired narratives are things that the AJC has been part of helping produce. And um, this is this is because they're interested in um, also pushing the like massive narrative we're seeing. Uh, nationally around like the crime wave and fear mongering around resources. Um, they call it, you know, first responder resources and um, a crackdown on crime. And so uh, this is part of like the local media ecology. But in response to this repression, we actually, as I mentioned earlier, like the AJC just put out an article questioning the, the legitimacy of the application of domestic terrorism in this instance. Also, um, we're this type of um, coverage coming out from a lot of new sources. There's been a really like massive um, influx of interest. Um, Al Jazeera or AG Plus, a really good video um, where they 
explores political dynamic. Um, and um, yeah, on social media, there's been a huge outpouring of support for the struggle. It's been really beautiful to see a lot of outrage on behalf of the arrest and people uh, really recognized by this um, level of undue repression um, and just, uh, you know, the, the, the tree sitters who have been a, a really massive symbol and really in, an inspiration to so much of the movie, its supporters, um, being attacked by the police is outraging people. Um, and it seems like that's translating into a lot of support. But on the other hand, we've also seen on Twitter, you know, um, which is like really crazy, uh, you know, people who, uh, who are talking on Twitter, um, and his collusion with the right wing with, with Andy No, namely, um, where saw Andy No, who's, who's occasionally tried to drum up some animosity movement on Twitter, uh, directing information about it to actually, um, yeah, this happened on Wednesday, um, or Thursday of this past week. And then just a few hours later, it's going down, which has been one of the platforms that's shared a lot of information about the movement, published articles that people have written, um, and perspectives on, on the struggle for many months now. It's going down was, was banned from Twitter and their account was taken down. Uh, uh, period of time that Twitter's banning that uh, report on technology, that report on financial interests and how this, uh, yeah, this is like definitely of concern to us as well about what type of attention this might bring towards, towards political activists and um, it's going down. Um, in addition to that, it's like there is a whole aspect of this movement which is positioning itself against um the world offered to us by sort of the tech giants um and by you know the the interests of the billionaires and so there is also this this part of it um the fight has been you know largely about cop city but it just also massively people mobilizing against the interests of Hollywood in gentrifying and displacing people in Atlanta in the same way that giant tech companies have done in other major cities, um, especially majority black cities across the country. Um, beyond the, the displacement of people from their physical homes, from their neighborhoods, you know, uh, of a um, of forest and parkland in cities across um we also have an aspect of the struggle which says we reject the life of sort of the body of um just like netflix and zone out um that's like what life is too and uh th this is to um t to many people in in exchange for you know selling all of your life your uh, your labor um and in an economy where this is enforced by, uh, you know, Aratus. Um, so that's, uh, a kind of interesting convergence of different aspects of the struggle. Um, I think there are so many different things that have spoken to people and we're seeing, we can cut that. This sort of overreach by the, the police investigations really likely at the sort of request of their funders, and actors of the project um, is is backfiring on are really uh, fired up about. This movement has grown pretty wide and gotten a lot of coverage, inspiring resistance in other places, like I mentioned. And I've heard that some of the investors have backed out of the project. You mentioned that the police are going hard now because it seems like they've been embarrassed by the movement's success. Can you talk a little bit about the success of the movement to defend the forest? Yeah, so I think that this movement has drawn out the lines that connect the issues that many are deeply familiar with between ecological struggles, anti-racist struggles, and abolitionist struggles, you know, struggles against the police and also against displacement and um, gentrification. And so 
one of the successes of the struggle to defend the forest has been articulating how all of those things fit in together and also from drawing on a really broad understanding of what the movement can be and all the different people that have a stake in this fight to uh, like push back on the narrative that we see used for counterinsurgent purposes time and time again that says, you know, the only people who can fight in protest in a struggle or, you know, this narrowing set of, of people like, you know, that, that promotes the false idea that that there are the, the right like right actors to fight for a, a issues of justice in fact like issues of of justice and injustice are you know of consequence and Im- importance to everybody and it's a lie that there are some people who have more of a right to struggle than others um in fact the construction of cop city is something that concerns everybody and the movement has been really clear about inviting participation from anyone who feels moved to defend the forest and to to fight the the uh, expansion of the police training center and the Hollywood studios. Some of the other successes have been really broad participation, sustained resistance um, that's been resilient in the face of heavy you know attempts by police to control the forest, to displace people from the protest encampment, and to discourage participation in this movement. And we've seen time and time again that when the police act to repress this movement, it, it strengthens and it grows. And that is a testament to how seriously people take this issue, the willingness and bravery in the face of police intimidation and violent tactics like what we've seen in the what we saw in the woods this week. There's a really like a strong sense of determination from participants in this movement to fight for what is right. And I think that that is a huge success. I hope it only grows from here. So how can listeners be supporting those caught, who caught charges in the wider movement against Cop City and the film studios and, and for the forest? I've seen on social media posts that that there are ways to support the arrestees, sending books, sending letters and such. And I'll definitely post some of that to show notes. What are some good ways, some good news sources to keep up with in your estimation? You can can support the movement by following what's happening. There are a few different platforms to follow. There's Defend Atlanta Forest, which is on Instagram, Telegram, Twitter, and has a website. There's Stop Cop City, also on Instagram and Twitter. Community Movement Builders, local organization in Atlanta that's heavily involved in the movement. They have... um, their, their own information. The Stop Reeves Young campaign or the SRY Sorry campaign has information about uh, those who are involved in the construction of Cop City and contracted by the Atlanta Police Foundation. So there's information on all of those. The Atlanta Solidarity Fund is providing information about the arrests um, and financial support for the arrestees can go to the Atlanta Solidarity Fund, um, which is a politically oriented bail fund and legal support fund here in Atlanta. Um, They're amazing. They do really good work. And um, yeah, you can also support by raising awareness about this issue, about the arrests and repression of environmental activists in Atlanta in your own context, um, having an info night, organizing a letter writing. There are, you know, prosecutors and district attorneys, um, the Georgia attorney general who have um, purview over this case. And um, I'm sure uh, would hear from people who uh, take issue with the broad application of domestic terrorism to apply to this these activists. The final straw is a proud member of the Channel Zero Network of Anarchist Podcasts, and here's a jingle from another member of CCN. It's going down, and you're invited for what they're selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting or dying. It's going down, and you're invited for what they're selling. We ain't buying. There is no running. There is no hiding. There's only fighting. Or dying. 
It's Going Down is a digital community center from anarchist, anti-fascist, autonomous, anti-capitalist, and anti-colonial movements. Our mission is to provide an autonomous and resilient platform to publicize and promote revolutionary theory and action. Go to itsgoingdown.org for daily updates. Check out our online store for ways to donate and rate and follow us on iTunes if you like this podcast. If you would like to support The Final Straw, you can subscribe to our podcast via various platforms, follow and share our materials online, as well as give us feedback via the links at thsr.wtf slash tree as in link tree. To support our transcription work and wider project, you can subscribe to us via patreon.com slash TFSR. You can also buy some merch or find donation methods at tfsr.wtf slash support. And now some words from anarchist prisoner Sean Swain. What you say, what you say? On December 5th, we entered into a new era. And by we, I don't mean Americans or even humans on this planet, but all life on Earth. An event occurred that is so monumental, so singularly historic, that even cynical misanthropes like me might have cause to hope. Full disclosure here, though, before we go any further, you should keep in mind that I'm incredibly unreliable. And most of my scientific knowledge base comes from watching Star Trek. More so the next generation rather than the original, but the science was generally consistent across the show's spectrum. Just saying. What I'm talking about from December 5th is the nuclear fusion experiment at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory that occurred on December 5th, creating a net gain in energy for the first time ever. Now, just to be clear, this isn't nuclear energy like you get from a nuclear power plant. Nuclear power plants operate on nuclear fission, not fusion. Nuclear fission is the splitting of an atom, cracking it open, and that releases all kinds of harmful radiation that takes thousands of years to decay. It's also dangerous due to events like Chernobyl or Three Mile Island, a nuclear disaster and near disaster that resulted from humans being dumb or Fukushima in Japan that malfunctioned due to natural disasters and now belches thousands of gallons of radioactive contamination into the Pacific Ocean. That's fission. That's bad. Nuclear fusion is where you slam two atoms together, causing them to merge into a larger atom of a heavier element, releasing their excess mass in the form of energy. It's the same process that makes the sun burn, where hydrogen atoms fuse into helium, and we get all that heat even this far away. Don't just take my word for it. Ask Chief Engineer Jordy LaForge. U.S. government science monkeys in San Fran managed to duplicate this by training lasers onto a single target and heating it to more than 5 million degrees. As a consequence, they expended 2 megajoules of, of energy to create 3 megajoules. The implications of this are vast, and I'm surprised nobody in the mainstream media are talking about them. Well, maybe not so surprised. This has the potential to radically alter all human activity on this planet forever. We're talking about the potential of free energy. To make an analogy, in the world of Star Trek, they discovered cold fusion, which provided for free energy. In that world, nobody used currency anymore. Nobody paid for anything. Everything could be produced for free. And so, in that utopian vision of society with free energy, all advanced species were essentially on permanent vacation, free to explore their gifts and talents and make the universe a better place. With this successful fusion experiment, that's a possible future now. Free energy. If two megajoules creates three, then assuming this is scalable, 200 megajoules creates 300 million and so on. This means that the process for producing power can be operated on the power it produces and can give away the remainder. Free energy. If this can be safely scaled, and there's no reason to think that it can't, 
we can see the possible end of all fossil fuels and all other forms of energy production in just a couple decades. Along with this, we would have an end to the global economic order as we know it, as this free energy and mechanization would largely make human labor obsolete. With decreases in the human birth rate to death rate, as we've seen over the last decade, it's conceivable that we could allow our planet the space to heal and not kill all life through greenhouse gas emissions and overfishing and other toxic behavior. I'm talking about not just having a future, but a glorious one, one we deserve, one where we can all have the opportunity to thrive and experience joy and purpose. That's one possibility that could manifest from this scientific breakthrough. The other one is not so pleasant. Let's not forget that this technology and its development and use are in the hands of the U.S. government. The U.S. government does not have a track record of using developed technologies for bettering the world. Historically, the government always, always uses technological breakthroughs for military applications, always. Nuclear, sonar, x-ray, drones, you name it. And after the government exhausts all possible military applications for a technology, it then allows its limited use in the medical field, long after the technology finds its way into the private, for-profit sector. If this fusion free energy technology moves through that same gauntlet, we're all screwed. We'll have fusion subs and aircraft carriers on a dying planet with a surplus population, while the power elites engage in the greatest power grab in the history of human folly. An absolute dystopia where the privileged who make the rules monopolize control over unlimited energy and decide the few who benefit and the many who don't. December 5th, all life on this planet entered a new era. In this new era, the struggle over who has power and how it's wielded has never been more crucial. All power to all the people. Now that means two things. This is Anarchist Prisoner Sean Swain from the Super Duper Uber Mega Ultra Hyper Turbo Multi Maxi Max in Youngstown, Ohio. If you're listening, you are the resistance. You can still write Sean at his new old new again address at Sean Swain number A two four three two zero five OSP Youngstown eight seven eight Coitsville Hubbard Road Youngstown Ohio four four five zero five. You can find his past writings, updates on his case, hear his past audio, find out how to get his books, plus ways to contribute to his legal defense fund at SeanSwain dot org. This is The Final Straw. This show will later be archived at thefinalstrawradio.noblogs.org, and you can email us with questions and suggestions at thefinalstrawradio at riseup.net or thefinalstrawradio at protonmail.com. If you'd like to use any episode for your project or radio show, feel free to do so. Just send us an email to let us know. If you care to, you can send us letters at The Final Straw Radio, P.O. Box 6004, Asheville, North Carolina, 28816. This show is brought to you by Firestorm Books and Coffee. Located at 610 Haywood Road, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a worker-owned co-op in Asheville specializing in offbeat, underground, and independent literature. You can find a catalog of Firestorm's books and zines, plus a full calendar of events up at their website, firestorm.coop.